it's all it's up to you, Chief. All right. Um. Well, to start off, I wanted to um ask you, how did you meet Maureen? I met Maureen through my father. Um, when Maureen was a little girl growing up in San Diego, uh, she played a lot of older men in her 30s, and my dad was one of them. And uh, after she grew up a little bit older and started winning all these championships and winning nine Grand Slams and winning Wimbledon three years in a row and winning the only women in, in America to have won the Grand Slam in one year. I don't know if you knew that. But Billie Jean never did it, Chris ever, Serena never did it. And they made a commit, commemorative uh, stamp in their honor this year, the Postal Service. So after she got off the circuit, when she got a horseback riding accident, got injured, she, she was married, got married and had two children, lived in San Diego. As a favor to my father, she gave my sister and I lessons for three years when I was 12, 13, and 14. And that's when I first met her in a lesson. And, uh, and then she moved to Scottsdale, Arizona. But in those three years, I learned more that, that lasts me for a lifetime from Maureen Conley. She was an incredible person, very positive, very upbeat, very motivational. And uh, she was just a great person all the way around. So how would you say, um, as you were saying, a great person, how would you say she was like, like obviously, like as a as a coach and like as a player, did she, um, you know, help, I, I know you said like she helped you a lot and you learned a lot from her. Right. What were some things that you learned from, from Marie? Well, I learned three or four really key things. One, I learned how to hit the ball on the run. Mm -hmm. and, and, I was able, and I was able to direct the ball with my hand on the dead run and I could hit it anywhere. It was my best shot since I was 13 and it stayed with me through college at UCLA and on the pro circuit. I remember one time um, I was at set point against Ilya Nastasi. Ever heard of him? Uh, yeah. yeah you, they call him nasty. And uh, very difficult to play against because his antics were pretty bad. But uh, I had set point, I had a running forehand, and uh, most of the time I'd go down the line, but I knew he had to cover it down the line, so I rolled it cross court with my hand without looking up, won the set. So that's the one thing she taught me, finish your hand up to your target and the yeah. ball will go there. And I want you to remember that. And uh, one way to do it is to keep your elbow straight. Mm -hmm. If you bend it too soon, it goes back. So keep it straight all the way through the swing like Jokovic and Federer, and then they go back. But she taught me that. She taught me to work harder in a shorter period of time than waste your time five hours a day. She's, you get more out of it. It's, um, you, you, and you, you don't get burned out. If you do five hours a day, it's called diminishing returns. There's a point that you don't get anything out of it. She felt to be fresh, work real hard intensely for two hours, then go back and do something else, get away from the courts. Because if you just hang around the courts all day, you get really jaded. Yeah. That's number two. She taught me to never let up in a match, never feel sorry for your opponent. Because if you do, they may get confidence and come back and beat you. So you don't want that to happen. You can still be a good person and beat someone badly. You just you, you, you befriend them after the match, go and have lunch with them, but, but never, ever let up. Don't ever feel sorry for your opponent. Right. I had 13 nationals, first annual, 1963, quarterfinals. Not that I remember every point, but I do. I had this Dickie Dell from Maryland, who's a clay court player, and I'd never played on clay before. I'm from California, this is my first, but I was up 4-1 in the third set. And I had no parents, no coach. I was with my doubles partner's mother, came back on a train. I had to figure it out myself. I was so thirsty, 110 degrees. I was so thirsty, all I could think of was getting a Coke. I was dying of thirst, and I lost the next five games. I let up, and it, I never forgot it, all these years later. So when, what I learned 
is when you're up 4-1, you gotta pretend like you're down 4-1. You play better when you're down. A lot of people come back because they focus. So pretend, if you're up 5-1, pretend like you're down 5-1. Then you'll, you'll, you'll close out the match. Marine also taught me to, um, to take breaks, to don't play tennis every day of the year and five hours a day, to get involved with your schoolwork and your friends and uh, maybe even play another sport like basketball or something that helps tennis, and, which I played basketball. And um, she said, enjoy tennis, enjoy the people, travel the world, and uh, great benefits out of tennis. It's a wonderful sport, and that's what she taught me. That's, that's really good. What do you think that made Maureen as good as she was when she was playing in the pros? Her determination, her work ethic. She hated to lose. She just, she, it kept her pushing herself. And um, she's just very competitive. She had that fire in her. And right. you can't teach that to someone. You either have that desire or you don't. And a coach can't teach you to, your parents can't make you have it. You've got to want it yourself. And that's why it's almost good not to have a coach or parents around you to play a big tournament, because it's all you. You can figure it out how to win by yourself. Right now, too, there's too much nurturing going on. And you'll see uh, a child with, with, with all their parents <laughs> carrying their bags for the child. And you see a coach talking to them. And, and the kid maybe can't think for himself. You gotta figure out in situations what works. You know, when you're up match point, 540, in the third set, do you think you should go for a winner? When you're up match point, um, I, I, I would. You would? Well, if you well, have. Well, think, try this, think, reverse it. Who do you think has the pressure? Who's got the pressure on them? Um, Matt, uh, your opponent or you? Uh, your opponent? Yeah. Is that a question? <laughs> well, think about it. They're yeah. down two match points. Don't you feel yeah. pressure when you're down two match points? Yeah. You got the pressure on you. So, you. so you don't want to give them a free point by going for a winner. Stupid. You, you, you let them back in the match. So you gotta learn to, to, you gotta be steady. Let them get nervous. God, God, the guy's not gonna give me a point. He's not gonna give me a free point. Oh my God, I can't, I gotta work, I gotta, I gotta try something to win the point. Then they gamble, then they lose the match. So you get into your steady mode. When you're, don't say, oh, I got plenty of match points. Uh-uh, get that first one and make them pay. Okay, I learned that as I got older, big time. That's huge. Does that make sense? Yeah. A lot of kids just try winners. They give away the free points. They lose a the game. Then they wonder why they lost the match. It's all up here. So how did Maureen, um, you were saying that she inspired you. How, could you go a little more in detail into how she inspired you? She, she basically um, was a very positive person. She, was, she never was negative with me, ever. And so that's how she was motivational. She didn't put me down. And some coaches are like drill sergeants. And especially girls don't like to be, they're very sensitive in their teenage years and um, you gotta be careful. Um, so she was always upbeat, very positive, very happy. And, and say, look, you did a great job today. You just need to do this. And she was never, never negative. And, um, and just made me feel good about myself. And that's, that's how, she helped me and that's how she looked at the game. She uh, was very positive and very ambitious and had a lot of drive in her. Got it, got it. So, um, moving on, I wanted to ask you about, um, more about like you and your story. Like how was it like um, when you were playing juniors and then you moved on to college and then eventually the, the circuit, yeah. how did, um, how did you achieve all these? How was that? Well, I achieved it by taking one goal at a time, trying to get the highest ranking in the 11 and under. Back then it was 11 and 13s. 
and I someone sent me the old Southern California 11 under rankings and I was fifth in the 11 under it is no indication how you're going to do way up here you got to start somewhere as long as you're improving that's the key and a lot of kids so I survived it each step of the way every week you lose unless you win the tournament right so you lose more than you win so you got to learn how to be positive and look forward not backwards and you got to keep improving um, and I kept going forward and my dad taught me one thing he had other people coach me but one thing he when I was 11 he said let's see how many balls in a row we can hit without missing okay my dad played for UCLA in 1937. He's a good player. At that time, he was 41. So we went to University Heights, where Marine started your tennis. There's a recreation center under the lights. He said, you'll have to focus harder under the lights to see the ball. So it's good to play under the lights to make you really focus. We did 310 times without missing. You ever done that? Um, I've attempted to do that, but never 310. Well, that's, that's my goal to you. Any other child out there, I want to see if you can go on a ball machine or have someone feed you balls, so you hit the ball 310 times, and you beat my record. No, that t what do you think that teaches you? Uh, I'd say it teaches you uh, focus and concentration. Focus and concentration. And that's what the kids need today. They're all being looking at the pros hitting winners, but they all started at 10, 11, being steady. Jimmy Connors was very steady as a kid. As he got older, he hit the ball harder, but steady. As he got older yet, he hit the ball harder, but steady. So you gotta work on your steadiness first, and then, then start working on your power later, not the other way around. And so that's what I was taught. Steady first, hit the ball in the run, hit the target, as I got older, I got stronger. And then all of a sudden, my same swing hit the ball the same place with more power, without tension. Mm -hmm. I was relaxed. And, uh, but I did one step of the way, rankings. I had success, enough success, to make myself happy. People say, you know, just enjoy the game. Well, I enjoy the game when I win. Like well, you do too, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> and so, I, I just love winning. I love the little trophies. I love trophies, um, but I got success in doubles, young age, and I love my doubles partners. We went fishing together and had great relationships, and, and that really made fun tennis for me. I traveled with them back east on a train for the 13 Nationals, and that was part of my happiness in tennis. If, if you don't have that happiness, it's, you're going to quit when you get a certain age. You know, once you make your own decision, you're out of there. And a lot of kids quit because of that. You gotta enjoy the game. And luckily I enjoyed the game. And uh, when I got a little bit older, when Marine left uh, to Arizona, my mother lined me up with a pro who had won Wimble in 1934, won the doubles, Les Stofan. He taught the La Jolla Beach of Tennis Club. He actually worked with Marine, which is a little girl. And he gave me two gifts. He gave me the gift of how to watch the ball properly. And that kept me through my whole life in tennis. And that's the name of the book. Yeah. Point of impact. Okay? Point of impact means you stay in the present. Now, ever miss the ball that goes in the net? Yep. Have you seen the ball go in the net? I'm sure you have. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why it went in the net. You're looking during the swing. What does Roger Federer do? He stays throughout the whole swing. Really? Well, that's the foundation of tennis. On every stroke, you gotta fall, watch the point of impact until you finish the whole stroke. It's only one split second. You still see the ball go over the net. But everybody in big point, all the, every juniors, everybody especially, they all look. And that's why they're hitting balls out and choke. That's called choking, by the way. Choking is looking at the future and not staying in the present. Now, why do people look up, do you think? 
Um, well, because they they want to see where their ball is going to land. Right. Well, if you already know where it's going to go, then you don't need to look up, right? Yeah. And that's what I teach. You know how you know where the ball goes? By leading with your with your arm or with your hand. Remember? Yeah. The hand. And how do I know how to direct the ball with the hand if I'm looking frozen here? Right now, my peripheral vision, I see your dad. Mm -hmm. So if I want to follow through to your dad without looking up, I just go there. It's the peripheral vision that people are not taught. And the only way you have peripheral vision hit the ball early. Hit the ball late, I can't see your father. And you hit late because you're standing straight up. If you get down low and hit the ball early, now I can see your mother without looking up. I can see the chair without looking up. But I actually see the blur of the ball hit the strings. If you don't see the blur of the ball hit the strings, you're not watching it properly. And that's one thing you can improve your game by 70% in a match. If, if you don't worry about the result of the, of the, of the match, but worry about one thing, the whole match, is watching the point of impact. And guess what will happen? You'll have good results. You'll end up winning point after point after point. And your opponent will look up and, and miss points because they haven't been taught this or emphasized. They've been all say watch the ball, but they haven't really gone to the detail of actually making them stay the whole time. And that's what Les Stofan taught me. It was a gift. He's ever missed an easy overhead? Yeah. Okay, I can tell you why. Because I like look down early? Absolutely, that's right. On every stroke in tennis, your arm stays up, you hit the ball above your hand, and your eyes stay up there forever on an easy overhead when you have a match point. The motion puts it in. You have a good motion, I'm sure. Yeah. So let the motion hit it in. The only reason why you miss it is because you want to see if it goes in. It's going to go in by itself. Have faith. It's called faith. Let the motion hit it, freeze it, and you'll never choke an easy overhead again, ever. And I never did after that. Through, through my years at UCLA and the Pro Tour, the bigger the point, I never looked down match point in the volley, I never looked over. And, and I still had time to see it go to where it went. Mm -hmm. You don't realize how much time you have. Mentally, you think you have no time, but you actually have plenty of time to swing. One split second, the ball's not reached the net yet. So you still see where it goes. You still see it come back. It's all psychological. So if one, it's another thing, if, if the juniors want to improve their game without changing one thing, this is it. And that's why it's my mantra. And if you go in the shop and look up on the wall, which I want you to do, take a picture of what's on the wall. It says point of impact. You watch the point of impact until you finish the follow through on every stroke in tennis. Serve, overhead, volley, volley, I stay there. Behind you. Ever been off balance yeah. and missed the ball? The reason why you, when you miss the ball off balance, and the pros don't miss it, because they exaggerate not looking up. Most people off balance, they look. They're disciplined to the point they don't look up at all. And they, don't, they get it back. So that's a discipline that you can practice. <laughs> um, once you realize it, you can practice that. Um, what else did I learn growing up? Stofan gave me the, the gift of the volley. The volley. Show me your quick, just with your hands, how you volley. Um, just like an okay. step. Okay. I'm going to teach you the advanced way to volley today. He t you ever seen, um, well, watch Nadal volley or a Jokovic volley. They use their hands. They're not using their arms. John McEnroe was a great volleyer. If you watch his tape, you should watch his tape. He used his hands. He could angles, drop shots. I saw uh, Nadal when the French uh, team had a ball at his feet when he was at net. 
and Nadal just used his hands and hit an angle volley winner. And that's a gift Stofan gave me. The, the volley ended up being my best part of my game and got me, um, that's why I was so good in doubles. And I got a scholarship to UCLA because of it, because of my doubles ability and my singles improved because of that. And I ended up being number one on the team the last two years. So he gave me a huge gift, watching the point of impact and the volley. So that's why you should play doubles every time you play and try to get to net. You gotta learn how to serve and volley. Don't serve and stay back. You gotta learn how to get the ball in front of you, get to net fast, hit the first volley. You need to be an all-around player. Because what happens if you play someone who's better than you in the backcourt? You need to try to finish quicker, the points? Well, you go to net. Yeah. You know what going to net does? It takes time away from the opponent. It takes time away, but also narrows his target. Big time to one third of the court versus the whole court. So under pressure, you'll find out what weaknesses he has. He's gonna have weaknesses. If you find those weaknesses, you can play into it by make, he'll probably lob. That's why you wanna work on your overhead and never look down. Mm -hmm. You gotta work on your volley and overhead if you go to net. But that's how I raised my level in the juniors. In the 16 and under, I started serving volley a lot more. And you've heard of Stan Smith? Heard of Bob Lutz, his doubles partner? Well, Bob and I won the 16 Nationals together. And we got lots of semis of the 18s the next year. But we were great at net. You know, we could angle them. And, and so by the time I was 16, I really knew how to volley well. So that, that's your goal, is to be able to win points as well at the net as in addition to the backcourt. And then I'll help your your appeal to college coaches, because double still counts. If you're a good all-around coach, an all-around player, the coach is more likely to pick you because you can play doubles as well as singles. Right. So there's good reasons to learn how to do that. And double skills, the returner serve, the chip, the lob, help you return serve to, to a, a, a half the court, all improves your singles play. So Stofan taught me that. I go to UCLA. Now it's the competition that really improved my game, playing every day with top players at UCLA. And then it was hard for me to find players to play in San Diego. By the time I was 16, I won the San Diego men's counties when I was 16. So I go up and stay, spend a weekend with Bob Lutz and we practice at the LA Tennis Club. And, um, and so having a six really good players or more practice like the academies have now. We didn't have academies back then. We had private lessons and we had to find our own players to play with. So what they have now is great. You have to bring people together to practice with. And um, so my conditioning, the coach at UCLA, Glenn Bassett, um, was a conditioning coach and he raised my level from here to here, conditioning-wise. I won matches because of my conditioning. I didn't beat Bob Lutz until I was 21. I beat him when I was 16, and I didn't beat him until I was 21. In the USC-UCLA match at, at UCLA, in front of 3,000 people on local TV, and it, it was conditioning. Um, overhead, ever done an overhead volley drill? Yeah, yeah. Hit over and run to the net. Our coach made us do it until we dropped. And on the big point in the match, uh, I was serving for the match. I was down break point, hitting overhead. I ran to the net automatically, put away a volley. That was strictly from drilling. And our coach made us do this again and again and again. And then after practice, we had to run. But it was all in two hours. It wasn't four or five hours. And I was dead. Then I go to class the next morning and do it all over again. And so UCLA raised my level because of the conditioning. And also the positive reinforcement from the coach. He also was not a negative coach. He kept telling me, Roy, you never miss a volley, you never miss a volley. So I believed it. And I would go through a match never missing one volley. So a lot of his power of positive reinforcement by your coach. It helps you feel good about yourself. So. 
Uh, when when you went into the circuit, um, you played against uh, Borg and uh, Nesta says you were saying, um, how did you manage to um, play against these tougher opponents that were like really good? Like you were able to get a couple sets off Borg and uh, and also Nesta said. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I was one of the top college players at the time, and um, my partner and I got to the finals of the NCA doubles against Smith and Lutz, and um, and we finally beat them six months later. So we, we were good in doubles, um, but when you go on the pro circuit, all of a sudden you're playing the top players in the world, and you're not winning as much where you're used to winning matches in the juniors. So all of a sudden, psychologically, it's hard to have confidence. So when I joined a group called World Championship of Tennis Tour, that, who, which was owned by a billionaire, Lamar Hunt, who's a founder of the American Football League. Um, he, he signed eight players, called the Handsome Eight, then he signed 16, and then I signed up when there are 32 players. And there was who's who in tennis. It was like Nadal, Federer, and Jokovic all being in that group. It was Arthur Ashe, John Newcomb, Rod Laver, Tony Roach, Fred Stolle. All the top players in the world were in this group, so I had to I had to play them first round every week. And my first pro match was against John Newcomb. I already won two or three Wimbledons. And I didn't see a ball. I mean, he just served an ace after ace. And, and next week was Arthur Ashe. Next week was Tony Roach. This is a joke. <laughs> These guys were my idols. And I was barely getting games off of them. But, but what I was doing, I was playing the name. Ever played a number one seed and been psyched out? Yeah. Well, same thing in the juniors. Instead of worrying about the ranking you're playing against, you got to worry about what you're doing yourself. So the second year, I was used to being around these guys. I started realizing, okay, I may lose a match, but I gave myself many goals. I'll be successful playing raw labor today. If every second serve that he serves, I'm going to go to net. I'm going to put pressure on him. I don't care if I get past. Instead of being afraid to get past, I don't care. I'm going. If he has a short ball in the ground strokes, I'm going to net. Well, guess what? I won the first set. And I almost broke him in the second. This is in Denver, Colorado. They never, 5,000 people are watching it. My wife went in the restroom and threw up. <laughs> and it was incredible, but I barely lost my serve. You know, do sad, do, do sad. He barely held his. Then all of a sudden he raised his level. He never threw his racket. He didn't get mad when he lost. He was a gentleman. He just raised his level. Once I started missing, I was hitting every ball on the line. Once I gave him a miss hit or an easy ball, that's when he started opening up his talent. But I got a set. And I got in two matches against Laver, I, I took him in three sets twice. So I raised my level. I raised my confidence, even though I lost the match. That's what you need to do against the number one seed. Okay, he's great. He's won the nationals. What you do is work, give yourself many goals. And if you do them, you've accomplished your goals. And that's how I, fig I figured out myself. And uh, I write that in my book, the, some of the many goals I gave myself. And uh, I took... Um, Tony Roach to three sets, and against Borg, center court. Not that I remember every point, but I do. It was 110 degrees, three o'clock in the afternoon. I could hardly serve the first game. I double faulted, I think, the first two times. I barely held my serve, and I won the set, 7-5. I won the second. And now it's, he wins a third 6-2. No, actually, I'm sorry. It goes a third set, it's four on a third set. His serve, add out. Break point, if I win it, I serve for the match. 
I'm that close. And I went for it, okay? And I learned from this. I went down the line, it was wide open. I missed it by an inch. It, I, it would have been, I, and I, I thought, what should I have done differently? Well, if we had gone in, I would have won the match. But who has the pressure? He does. Yeah. I should make him volley. He's not the perfect volleyer yet. So I should hit hard down the middle, give myself margin of error, make him hit a volley, then I have a chance to pass him. So the percentages would have been in my favor and I could have won that match. So it's, shot selection's huge. That's why you gotta learn when you're playing what to do and what not to do. But be more conservative. Sometimes you gotta take chances, but sometimes you gotta be smart and think of how much pressure's on your opponent and give it to them. Give them pressure. And uh, that's what I learned playing these guys. I uh, had my last US Open was 1974, playing the Stasi. And uh, I was up two sets to one, but he wore me down. It was conditioning. If I had a conditioning coach, I could have won that match. But he, he was so tough, got every ball back, lobbed deep, ran every ball down. Man, he wouldn't give any free points. So that's what, you, you gotta be a tough competitor. You, you can't give any free points away. Right. And that's what these guys did. They were steady as anything. Then when they needed the power, they had it. So that's how he did it. Many goals. And um, so we know, as you were saying, you played um, a lot of Grand Slams. Right. How did it feel the first time that you walked on court to, to a Grand Slam like Wimbledon? Well, it was, uh, Incredible. It was my lifelong journey. I never thought I'd ever play Wimbledon. My only goal was to play college tennis because after that you have to go in the Army, which you won't have to do. Back then it was mandatory, but I was very lucky. They started the lottery system and I lucked out, won the lottery because I wasn't picked and I was able to go on the pro tennis tour instead of the Army. But I got my first Wimbledon, 21-year-old, and I had to play the second-ranked American player first round, Clark Gravener. And I found out at the NCAs in San Antonio, Texas, by telegram. Back then, they didn't have points. They had rankings. And I was ranked 13 in the nation in men's singles, so I was next in line. Mm -hmm. And so I found out I had to fly over and play Gravener supposedly the next day, which if you ever go to Europe, you need two or three days to acclimate yourself, time difference. Mm -hmm. Luckily it rained and I had a day off. Then I played them the next day, but guess what happened? The subways were on strike. I couldn't get a subway ride to the Queens Club where you warm up, have lunch, and get a limousine ride to Wimbledon. I'm alone, I don't have anybody help me. No cell phones. I, I, I called down, got a taxi, finally got to Queens Club, had no lunch, no warm up, got taken to Wimble, and here it is, my dream, my dream come true, and I'm not ready, really ready to play the match. My opponents on the court cussing me out. They did not default me because they knew the subways were on strike. So I was lucky there. I was down 6-2, 6-3, 2-5, match point, my serve. But I didn't give it to him, okay? I, I hung in there, won that game. And he got a little bored. I could tell he started looking on the other, his buddy playing the next court over. He kept missing his first serve, so I went to the net. Grass was real fast back then compared to today. It didn't bounce very well. I chipped and charged. I broke a serve. I hold serves five all now. I win the set. Ah, next set, it started raining. I break a serve because he couldn't stand up. He didn't call the match. I serve, I couldn't stand up. So I lost my serve. They finally called it after, after two bad games. Next day I come back, I get I warm up, have breakfast but I'm down 5-3 in the fourth now. 
Same thing happened. I hold, he misses first serve. I go to net, I break, I win the set 8-6. Now I'm in the fifth set. Now I'm just playing tennis. I'm not thinking Wimbledon. I'm just thinking of focusing on the ball, aiming for my targets and getting to that net, which is my ability. Had nothing to do with, with the world champ, but the first set or so I was overwhelmed. But once you get zoomed in on what you're doing in the present, you forget about everything else. So if you play a first round local tournament versus the nationals, the word nationals is, but a forehand's a forehand, a volley's a volley, the court's the same dimensions. So you get, forget who you're playing against and where you're at, just play your game. And that's what I learned uh, when I started playing the players. If I had a good volley, no matter who it is, I'm not going to get it, whether it's Rod Laver or, or somebody else. So you got to work on your game. And I learned that, and that's how I got confidence. Even though I lost a match, it went to 5-all, 6-all, 7-all, 8-all, 9-all, 9-10 my serve, 30-all. He had two winners. He just gambled. The match is over, 11 9 the fifth. I came that close, but it gave me confidence. And I walked off the court dejected, and one person came up to me and gave me confidence. She's a legend. Ever heard of Billie Jean King? Yeah. She came up to me and said, Roy, you know you have what it takes when you play well at Wimbledon. And I never forgot that. And I talk about it in my book. That meant a lot to me, because I had no one else there, a coach or anybody, and she, she instilled that I really did something good. I never gave up. And what I learned in college uh, that helped me come back is that there's a, there's a coach at Pepperdine who just retired called Alan Fox. He, he's he got a PhD in psychology. He played for UCLA, won the NCAAs, singles and doubles, top 10 in America. He was only five feet seven, but tenacious as anything. He used to practice when he was going to for his PhD at UCLA, and I was a freshman. And I played just like him, but he was better at it. He wouldn't give me any free points. I hated it. But he, he grabbed my shirt, said, Roy, you gotta hang on like a crab. Never, ever let up. Never give up. And so that was instilled in me. So I, I didn't give him a free point. I didn't give him the match, which I, which I could have at 5-2 in the third set. And because I didn't, I almost won the match. So that's a lesson to all of you, no matter how far you're down, don't give them the match. They may let up and you can get back in the match. And all of a sudden you, you get confidence and also I can win this match. So uh, that's a huge lesson I learned um, from Alan Fox. And I also talk about that in the book. Um, people helped me along the way. And hopefully whoever listens to this will, will try this when you compete. It's all, you, when, once you have the strokes, in the basics, now it's all mental. Now it's how you're thinking on, on points. You get, are you thinking positively or negatively? Right. You know else what my dad taught me when I was real young? That really influenced me. He said when um, your opponent throws his racket, are you happy or sad? Well, I'm happy. I, I, I know I got him. I got him. It, you ever seen me? Mm -hmm. Don't you feel good? Yeah. So he said, you don't want you, your opponent to feel good, do you? No. So then you don't show emotion. Pretend like nothing bothers you. It will really psych them out. And from that point forward, I was calm. And it really made a big difference because I, I wouldn't let my emotions be, you know, I was frustrated at certain points. I didn't let my opponent know it. And that would be very frustrating for your opponent because they wanted to see that you're going to give up. So my father taught me to you know, be steady and, and also emotions. Also, he taught me, don't enter tournament unless you're prepared. Just, just don't be entering tournaments. You gotta put some time in before you play the tournament. The tournament only shows you how well you've been practicing. That's all it does. Are they, 
So that's so, so parental influence is huge. At a young age, you're influencing your son big time um, by how you treat him. My parents also helped me develop because they never got mad at me for losing a match. I wanted to win so bad that I was upset enough as it was, if they got mad at me as well, I would have probably quit the game by the time I was 14. You probably see some parents out there are like that today, even more because they're thinking of a, a payback on the cir pro circuit or, or college, only one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent make it on the pros. So you really want to be going towards college and uh, feeling pressure from the parents financially is a really unfounded burden to put on a child. My parents never said, we want you to get a scholarship to help us save us money, ever. And that really helped me. I didn't feel the pressure. There's enough pressure. You feel enough pressure playing a match. You don't want to worry about financing your family at the same time. You know, and some people do. You know, especially the great players when they're 14. They see, you know, how this is our future. So, so parents are huge in developing a child as well. So that's a quick summary of how I evolved from a junior to college to the pros. And uh, I excelled in doubles on the pros. I beat, in my lifetime, I beat Arthur Ashe five times in doubles. I could beat people in doubles where I couldn't beat them in singles because I, half the court I could out, out quick them and they couldn't overpower me. And I beat Stan Smith in doubles two or three times, he and Bob Lutz and Ar uh, Marty Reeson and um, I beat Bob Lutz and Arthur Ashe, beat Nastasi and Teriak, um, some of the Ocker and Reeson, and so, um, you know, I had confidence on the Pro Tour and my doubles once again helped my singles. So I keep going back to doubles, but it really helped my life, plus my friendships. Tom Gorman uh, was a former Davis Cup captain, former top 10 in the world. I played doubles with him in 1970, we were number two in the nation in men's doubles. And I kept in contact with him over 50 years. And he's coming to Kiowa on Monday for a week. And I'm playing golf with him on Tuesday. So these relationships, I, I first met him when I was 13, your age. And I've known him ever since. So the big part of tennis is friendships. Do you have any friends playing tennis? Yeah. yeah. Aren't they, isn't it fun? Yeah, it is. Do you ever yeah. stay at anybody's house? And play, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was the fun part is private housing, staying with doubles partners and stuff. And um, if it's all hotel rooms, it's not nearly as fun. Borg got stuck in a hotel room when he was 16 on the pro tour, never had a normal life till he was 26 in the top of his career and he quit because he wanted a normal life. He lost those peak years, another 10 years. He could have kept going, but he didn't have a normal life, and he wanted it. It was all tennis, all hotel rooms. So you gotta have, have a balanced life, and so enjoy tennis, absolutely. That's a good question, though. That's how we evolve. So you were talking about um, a lot of the similarities between um, players like um, like Sampras and um, and now with like Roger and Rafa of like you know the, the fun or Serena and Chris Everett yeah right so all of them um, what would be some differences of how the game has changed from back then to now well game has changed one they have slowered the grass at Wimbledon big time so the ball bounces real high so an doll can win Wimbledon Back in the day, when the ball bounced this high, Nadal probably would not have won Wimbledon because he had to serve and volley every point. He had to go to net every point. So the game's changed that way. So you just can't go to the net now because the ball sits up like a duck. Right. And, and the equipment makes you hit a lot more faster with the same swing. I finally went from a wood racket to a, a Pete Sampras racket when they 
wouldn't make wood rackets anymore because I had the feel of a wood racket. It took me six months. I kept in the ball foot out with the same swing. And it took me a while to get the feel of this racket, but now once I have the feel of it, I love it. But the, the equipment is different. Also, the game has changed now that they have um, academies, which we didn't have, which kids are grouped together and they're actually playing good players every day, where we didn't have that. And so that's a huge advantage for the kids if they, if they take advantage of it. But they, some of them take it for granted. They don't realize how lucky they are. My mother and my, my dad used to call around to find people to play with me. It was hard to do it on your own. But here he is, all right there. You pay for it though, but you yeah. pay for the convenience. Um, but my son here is starting an academy. And um, last three years, they've got 10 kids living year round and they got a ton more during the season and it's growing. And I watch how they do it and they really is conditioning, which is great for kids, conditioning. I like to get to teach them the volley though. That's what I want. So that's a big change. Um, so you got equipment, you got the academies, um, you got all the courts are slower versus faster. More hard courts now. They took away the grass at Wimbledon, they took away the grass at Australia. Used to be three grass court grand slams and one clay court. The French. And um, I had to play a guy named Fanolovic from Yugoslavia, he had first round center court. <laughs> and I would, there were, ever heard of pressure, pressureless balls? Yeah, yeah. The French had press, pressureless balls. I couldn't crack an egg on my volley. It just set up like a duck. He ran it down and just hit these passing shots 10 feet high. I was used to balls down here. I really had trouble playing him. He ended up got, getting to the finals. Being a, he's a great clay court player. But um, it take, next year they changed the ball to a normal ball. And then people could serve volley on clay. But before they couldn't serve volley. Um, but the French is still tough. But there's three hardcore Grand Slams. And the, the only, I think, the only Grand Slam that the court's a little faster, I think, the Australian. I hear the commentators say it's fast, where the other ones are real slow. It was open and, and um, Aus not Australia, what I leave out. The French, Australia, US Open, and Wimbledon, yeah, yeah, grass. So that's basically how I say the game has changed. Got it. Um. Also, there's a lot of money in the Pro Tour now, and everybody's thinking Pro Tour, and they should be thinking juniors and college. That will happen if you do well here and here. Don't worry about that. You got to go through these stages here. Yep. So, I think that's that's it, right? Yeah. So, um, thank you guys for watching. Um, please check out. Feel free to check out. Um, Roy's new book, Point here, of Impact. Here we go. Um, and, uh, yeah. Got a nice forward by Billie Jean King. <laughs> I first met her when she stayed at my house when I was 13. Mm -hmm. She was uh, 17 or 18, and I've known her ever since. And she's a kind person, I tell you. Um, I had some major surgeries, and she found out about it, and uh, I'll my wife would go home after I, after being with me at the hospital and um, got a voice message from Billie Jean King. Now she's in a different world, right? I mean, I don't talk to her or see her, but I know her, but but she took the time to, to do that. And so she was kind enough to do the forward for this too, yeah. And I got 20 life lessons and I've got the history of, of transition from amateur to professional tennis because I played in the first open tennis at Wimbledon um, and I've got life lessons and business lessons in here and good tennis tips playing the top players so it's a multifaceted book that parents can learn from 
juniors can learn from and coaches can learn from. I have, I have my major tips in here, so a lot of stuff in here. And I'm going to give you a test on it. Okay. So I think I have one question that we might be missing really quick, um, and it's about your son's academy. Yes. It would be great. Do you can you give us like a, a general idea of how it works or? or sure, absolutely. Uh, it's called the Barth Houghton Academy. Uh, he, he partnered with Bruce Houghton, who had a, a junior academy up in Charlotte. He's from Australia, and he trained under really good coaches uh, in Australia. And uh, he brought the concept here with Jonathan. And um, he started, I think, two or three years ago with a handful of kids that came from Charlotte with Bruce here. And they stay in the villa on Kiowa, the year-round year ones. And then they bring in kids over Easter or during the summer to work out with them as well. Um, and they're pretty much kids who are looking to maybe to who play national tournaments or play U.S. state tournaments and would like to get better and go to college maybe. And uh, they, they come out, younger kids are playing one session a day and the older kids have two sessions a day, like hour and a half each. And they work on a lot of, um, a lot of conditioning. A lot of, they, they run before they, they play, they, they do agility drills, they do stretch and then they um, start hitting drills. Then he has them play points. You know, then they play doubles. So they do a lot of things every day. And, the, and the, you know, my two granddaughters are in it. I get two kids who play, and one's 11 and one's 13, going on 14. And their conditioning level has gone from here to here in matches. Their footwork has improved so much at a younger age because of the daily practice. I never had that. So it's great. Um, I see the kids improve over two months. My younger, Mackenzie, who's 11, she had a really awkward serve, and then over one winter, all of a sudden she's got the most fluid serve I've ever seen on the young girl. It's gonna really pay her dividends because she's got the perfect motion, relaxed, arm up, and, and the motion works. So you can improve things if you spend time doing it every day. But um, the academy's growing. As the word gets out, it's a matter of, of word of mouth, I think. Parents like to find other successes. A lot of parents fly in from Texas. They're moving here, and they want to see what it looks like and talk to, their, to Bruce and Jonathan and what their culture is and what, they're, what they believe in. And um, it's a, they're both very positive people. My, my Jonathan is, was a 10-month-old that uh, was born in Indianapolis when I was playing team tennis, and that made me get off the tour when he was born. And he worked for me for 20 years after college, and they, when I retired, they hired him. So he knows the system, and he always wanted to do academy, and he befriended Bruce, and they're a great combination. And uh, they take kids to tournaments, and they watch them play. Jonathan took, I think, eight kids last weekend to make, um, to um, Savannah for a tournament. And this weekend, my son is actually running a tournament in Florence. He's chairman of the Junior Council for South, for South Carolina and Southern. So he knows the junior system. He knows what tournament to put the kids in. Yeah, he knows a point system. So you need someone who is, whose children are playing. So he knows all that. So uh, it's good. Good for it because he directs the kids what they should be doing. What, what term, he, my older daughter is playing Florence, and my younger my younger granddaughter is playing Florence. My younger um, Mackenzie, the younger one, is um, playing, um, I think, Macon, Georgia, a bigger tournament, like a nationally rated. So she's got a little bit, um, doing a little better in her age division because she started younger. You know, she came along when she was seven, when the older one was nine, and so she just developed a little sooner. But it's fun watching them. You know, they'll be out here um, this after. Yeah, they they come out every day at I think 12:30. The older kids, 
and the younger ones come out in the afternoon. So it's 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 good. I uh, didn't have the energy to run at the academy. <laughs> I was a tail end of my career, and I said, Jonathan, go for it. You're young, do it. And he's he's got to do it. I mean, he's got on the phone all the time, talking to people, and um, and so that's what you need. It's, you need it by word of mouth, I think. And they go to tournaments, talk to people, and see the kids play and. I said, gosh, your kid's doing well, you know. You know, what, what do you do for him? Yep, perfect. And that's how I'm sure you find out about things as well. Sure, yeah. You talk. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for asking. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, of course, we're going to include, um, you know, we, we would love to include all this information. Of course, include um, your son's information, too. Oh, absolutely, so absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll get everything together. Yeah. Did you mention that they're coming here? Is the academy here? Like, uh, they use the courts? Oh, yeah. They use... Yeah. They use... Um, yeah, it's right here. Okay. Yeah, they come here... Um, They'll probably stay and watch them play. Oh, yeah. Here. Yeah, hopefully they'll be out, and I, I'll introduce you to Bruce. Oh, that's Bruce great. is out here right now. Okay. And uh, Jonathan's a Florence. Jonathan is, is involved politically. Uh, you follow my footsteps. Um, I was very involved with the USTA, okay. and it really helped my career. I can't tell you how it helped my job here. The people I met, uh, and I ended up moving up. The, I became president of South Carolina Tennis, got on committees for Southern, got national committees, and I ended up being chairman of the Davis Cup Committee. And I got to go to all the Davis Cup matches for, for six years throughout the world. Went to Moscow, went to London. Now, when I was 13, I could never dream of doing that. But Maureen told me, you know, enjoy the travel. Well, that's, I end up traveling the world because of tennis. I never dreamt I'd do it as a USTA official, but I just happened to go to a meeting, got involved, and all of a sudden, I like the people who I met, like working with them. And, um, and so I got involved that way. And, and I do talk about that journey in here as well. And um, for, for tennis pros, they should, should get more involved because they can make things happen. You can be chairman of a committee, you're not happy with junior tennis and get on the committee. They make the decisions. These people who never played the game, right. whose kids play, but they, and they're making big decisions. Right. That's how I got involved. The woman influenced me, said we need a pro to get involved so you can help guide us. Of course. They got, a, they, they were, they got away with the 12 and internationals because they thought it was too young. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, 13 nationals really gave me confidence. And look, Lil Mo, eight-year-olds, golf, these, all these Four great players that played when they're eight and ten. Yep. So, so Little Mo International is really they they got it. Yep. Kids love it. They 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 love they winning love matches at eight. Yeah. They love trophies. Yep. They have a big one. Have you seen oh, that? are you kidding? I would love Little Mo tournament. <laughs> I I just love the trophies. That's what kept me going.